Please welcome Dr. Anand Chingram. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm a doctor, but if any of you get a heart attack or anything else, I won't be of any use. Okay, so uh, we are running a bit late, but uh, why not build, build an appetite for lunch with an appetite for some provocative discussion? So that's what I'm going to do. And people are already leaving, so hopefully some of you will not offend me and, and, and stay. But, but what we'll try to do is look at uh, how we are going to handle the next decade. So, the last talk that I gave, not last talk, about three years back, there was one word difference. The talk that I'm giving today is what got you here will get you there. But the talk that I gave uh, three years back on a something different, a different uh, area was what got you here will not get you there. So why, the dif why this difference? In 2019, I decided to be a nicer person. So I'm, I'm going to encourage all of you. Actually, no, that's, that's not the reason. The reason is that in the past, I was trying to get, get our customers to think about how we were different in what I was doing at that time, what I'm doing at that time. But now what I believe is I really need to address what all of you have done over the course of last many, many, many years and why you need to kind of build on that. So just as a way, uh, uh, this is one of, one of the uh, papers that I wrote. And uh, unfortunately for you, or maybe fortunately for you, my code didn't make it into Postgres, okay? But, but some of the work that I did with, with, with Mike Stonebreaker and, and Spiros and others, some of you who either love or hate the triggers mechanism that, that, that Postgres has, and, uh, has had in the past, I had something to do with it. Okay? Uh, but I want to kind of begin with, with something. All of you have heard of this. My other car is a, right? And you can kind of put anything out there. In Berkeley, in 80s, I used to see this. My other car is a cutter. How many of you get this? Yes, and, and, and why? Why do I have a joke about Lisp here? Aha, uh -huh. because Postgres was originally written in Lisp. Okay? And, and, and it was written because at that time, we were all very excited about this thing called fifth gen AI. So, but anyway, thankfully, thankfully, all of you saw the way and converted into something that is that represents a more modern programming language. Okay, so over the course of next 15, 18 minutes, I won't tell you where to go. All of you know, you listen to customers, you listen to what's going on, but I hope that I can show you some North Star that will uh, be your guide. And I'm sorry, I like to kind of walk around. I'm slightly peripatetic, so. If it bothers you, I can stay here, but then it will not be half as entertaining. Okay, so uh, Postgres as a Berkeley project had ACID at its core, had this language called PostQuill that many of you uh, heard about, and had lots and lots of new innovations around it. Uh, I, was, I was part of at least some of the work that went on in the triggers, something called non-first normal databases, where, where instead of having just, just atomic values, you could actually have relational values in the columns, and et cetera. And there were tons and tons of other things. What was driving out there was really this concept of new apps. Mike Stonebreaker and others had a vision which said that, that there'll be these new classes of apps like financial data analysis and GIS and others that will actually drive the new database. And therefore, a lot of innovation that went on, went on because uh, many of us wanted to reinvent the database, but it went on also because we believe that many of these applications, these new applications will drive new needs, including, for example, this new R trees and others that you all are familiar with that came about because of uh, GIS database. What Postgres and all the databases, database engines at that time were able to do was to maintain what was the clean semantics between applications and database. The contract 
between the application and the database was fairly fixed. It was fixed in Postgres in the form of PostQL and in other databases in the form of other query languages. But what we realized is that this contract is not necessarily a perfect contract. This contract sometimes impacts performance. And therefore, over time, in Postgres history, apps became app minus minus, and DBs became DB plus plus, because databases started to incorporate certain constructs from applications so that the performance of those applications was better. And I've kind of listed uh, three of them out there, but there were many, many, many. And we'll keep coming back to this theme on what is the contract between the application and the database as you all think about the next decade or two of, of uh, Postgres. So this was Berkeley. You all took over. Many of you took over and, and uh, really have uh, engendered it and, and built it up. You gave up on certain things that were clearly interesting in, in, in late 80s, but not necessarily that interesting uh, afterwards. So some of the things were kind of given up. Uh, the language went from PostQL to SQL, an uglier language, but a more popular language. Uh, and, and, and then over time, uh, Postgres as a community added huge, huge number of features that, that many of the speakers before me have talked about. So I believe that Postgres has crossed into the pantheon of a truly great database. The list that, that size n we can debate, but that n is really, really small. Okay? So I want to say thank you very much. I was there in the beginning in a small part, but you all have actually brought it where it is. So thank you, folks, very, very much from the uh, uh, deepest part of my heart. So as you enter the fourth decade, what do you need to think about? First, fourth decade. Okay, How many technologies, how many technologies that you see today will be there in the fourth decade? Postgres. Cobol? No, 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 oh, dead, dead. Oh, no, no, definitely, man, of course, of course. And, and that's why, uh, yes, yes, I know. I've, I've, I was at IBM, so I know, uh, I know a lot about Cobol. Uh, but, but how many technologies are being continuously being built into and expanded? And, and it's absolutely, absolutely amazing. So, so, so we talked about developers running to something shiny. Postgres has been that shiny thing for three decades. You may not be able to see the dots, but, but you all have come a long way, a long way by both sometimes embracing and sometimes ignoring all the shiny objects that came around. Okay? I've listed some that you all have embraced, and I've listed some that you all have ignored. Through all of those distractions and uh, interactions, you have marched steadily forward. That, of course, represents the growth, but actually also represents as a community. So there's been something really strong about how you all have kept Postgres together in the presence of all the other things that are going on that you can see out there. Now, going forward, there are many, many more things that you'll get to look at. You can think about the cloud. Oh my god, cloud's coming. AI, every second sentence out of everybody's AI. Streaming, serverless. You see a lot of these things. And what I want to do over the course of the next 10, 12 minutes is kind of just uh, form a path for you all, hopefully, uh, through all these things that are happening. I won't mostly tell you what. 
I'll just tell you how. With me? 10 more minutes, lunch after that, OK? Um, so there are only three principles that you all have applied and that you need to apply going forward. The three principles are SQL, transaction consistency, and performance. SQL, transaction consistency, and performance. Why? I'm telling at the bottom. I'll make these slides available. OK, test. Who is the person on the left? Fantastic. Why is Don Chamberlain known? No, no answer from here. Why is Don Chamberlain known? Don Chamberlain invented SQL. Okay. Who is the person on the right? Andreas Reuter. Andreas Reuter invented ACID, not the San Francisco ACID, but the, data, but the database ACID. Okay? Revere these two people as gods. Okay? Wake up in the morning okay, and say thank you. Okay? Not for the ugly language that Don Chamberlain created, but the popular language that Don Chamberlain created okay? and acid. They, they will guide you to the future. I'm almost becoming rapturous, so that's not. OK, so let me just kind of tell you why. So the first thing you say is, can I relax ACID to accommodate more apps? As my app spectrum increases, can I start to do something like, like uh, eventual consistency? I don't know what eventual consistency. I know what eventual consistency is, but whoa. Did that thing happen, or did that thing not happen? Oh, if nothing else happens, then that thing happened. If something else happens, then I don't know what happened. I, I, I don't know what to deal with that. One phase commit, write, and be done. OK, so as you think about this, my answer is quite simple. Do not, do not give up on asset. Can I make SQL weird to accommodate more apps? Do you know my answer? No. OK? Yeah, oh my god, even Don Chamberlain, the god of SQL, got distracted into something called X, X query. And if you ask Don, how proud is he of X query? Don, uh, Don and I worked together at IBM. He'll say it's not his, one of his more proudest moments. And then you'll hear about Graph, GraphQL and others. Please, please don't get distracted. OK? Performance, the third thing. The third thing. The first is about ease for application building. Second is for correctness. And the third is the thing has to really break, work well. You as a community have done some phenomenal work in multi-core. And then around you, many other projects have come about. We heard about some of them who have taken that work and really built up the fact that Postgres is not just the easiest database to use, but it's also one of the best databases that exists with respect to performance. Please don't give up on performance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take three examples. I said four, but since we're going to run out of time, I'm going to skip on the fourth one, and you can ask me later on. I'm going to take three examples and show you how you think about these three constructs in potentially what might happen. I'm not going to talk to you about serverless. I'm not going to talk to you about autonomous because I'm not going to talk to you about buzzwords. Okay? I'm going to talk to you about things that I think are truly happening, even though AI is there, so we'll, we'll talk a bit about that. Okay, with me? AI. A great book, independent of, hey, Anand made sense or Anand did not make sense, please read this book. The second half of this book is, is phenomenal. It talks about the impact of AI on jobs 
and it talks about how AI and humanism can coexist. But most of what masquerades as AI is really machine learning. But what's happening is if you believe that databases are there to service the needs of applications, there's a whole new class of applications that are emerging. So for example, applications that are, are primarily AI or machine learning driven, they may be applications on Alexa or Google Home. And the key question is, what is the contract between those applications and the, and the database? If you really believe that more and more applications will be AI powered, what does it mean with respect to databases? Question is, can I move some of those application logic to the database? So if some of these applications are, are AI applications, they have to do what's called model building. Can I add model building logic to database? Remember, I'm just giving you kind of three examples of things that might happen in the future and how you should think about it. I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but I'm just giving you some path out there. So this was the first attempt at leveraging SQL SQL for data mining. This was done by, by a colleague of mine, uh, Rakesh Agrawal and Srikant and co at, at IBM. And it's a mess. It's a mess. It's a combination of wacko programming language constructs. I'm sure it'll, this will get to Rakesh and he'll say, what the heck. Uh, a wacko programming constructs and force fitting application logic into the database. If this is the future, then AI and databases will never coexist. But what's happening now is look at this, what's happened in both Madlib as well as in, in, in BQML. Look at this construct, okay? Much simpler, much cleaner, okay? If these constructs can, can really take off, then databases will be able to support these new AI-driven applications. The SQL does not look too ugly. Performance is another issue. Will these model building inside the database, I showed you the SQL for, for logistics regression. Will these logistic regression inside the database really perform? Just because you can express it doesn't mean that you will do it. It has to really perform. Now it turns out that some of these, some of these application logic can actually be done by kind of a couple of passes through the data and therefore they can actually really perform fairly well. So what you've got to think about is as these new classes of AI applications come about and as Postgres says, I want to be part of those applications and I want to support model building inside Postgres, either through Madlib or anything else, you've got to think about the SQL expressibility and performance. In three years, I believe that many of the stable models for these AI applications will actually move into the database. And it's up to us as a community to figure out what role do we play there. Let's talk about cloud. For me, the lesson on cloud is not scale. It's not the petabytes of data that you can manage. It's that you don't have to manage anything. So the lesson of cloud is, is not scale. Yes, scale, but, but not the primary lesson. It is actually low ops. You have heard a lot, <coughs> lot about machine learning in apps, I just talked about it in the previous section, and how databases can support machine learning in apps. I think one of the biggest innovations that will happen is machine learning embedded into the database, not for the apps, but for database operations themselves. There are some phenomenally new pieces of innovative work that's going on around managing databases leveraging machine learning techniques. The work is not just about, about determining what indexes to build. I argued with Mike Stonebaker all the time on 
whether Mike Stone Baker, by the way, is really tall, so I had to look up to him and, and talk to him about it. But, but Mike was, is it indexes or indices? And he said, it's indexes, and that's what it is. So uh, whether, whether you're going to build uh, indexes that are smarter, or you're actually going to build different indexes, the paper on the bottom right is about how you can actually use neural network as an index. But either way, either way, machine learning based DB admin, okay, will replace rule based DB admin. Okay? You all as a community need to learn machine learning not just for applications that will drive database workloads, but how machine learning will actually change how you build databases. Privacy. Privacy, privacy. Uh, if my son was here, he would uh, beat me up. Okay, in my uh, humble opinion, humble, uh, the single most important feature that will drive DB innovations in the next two decades. We all know about these issues. If you look at it, this is, this is a copy from, from uh, the Postgres manual, chapter 20, chapter 20, that late, uh, on uh, database roles, role attributes, privileges, and all that. That's all great. That says you can't do this, or you can do that, and this and that, et cetera, et cetera, and so on and so forth. All the controls in the world would not have prevented, all the database controls in the world would not have prevented the, the Cambridge Analytica event that happened at Facebook. There's something fundamental about privacy that is not just the, not the same as these things. So this is not sufficient, and because as I, which I'll, I'll kind of address, and it cannot be done outside the database. So you all will be central to making this work. OK, uh, one last quiz. Quiz, so late in the day, but so late in the session, but what the heck. Who is she? You wish you had image search on, on Google that you could just uh, drop that in. Her name is Cynthia Dork, Dork. And Cynthia Dork was again a researcher at, at uh, IBM and then went on to Microsoft and others. And she, along with a few others, did something called differential privacy. Differential privacy really says is that, how many of you have heard of differential privacy? If not, I do come, I am a slightly didactic, so I'll come across a professor, so, so humor me for a second. Differential privacy is quite simply that if you query something, instead of getting back the answer, you get slightly noisy answer. And that noisy answer enables, enables the, the database to hide the fact whether a particular individual was in that answer or was not in that answer. Make sense? If you're going to collect some count, if that count is kind of plus minus something, then you really don't know whether that person was in it or not. The problem with this, if this is differential privacy, the problem with this is that if you can repeatedly ask that question of the database, then you can actually get around any privacy protection mechanisms that are done. By repeatedly asking those questions, you can actually know whether Anant is in the database or not in the database, or what is uh, his uh, status with respect to any disease that you might be tracking. So this whole thing, privacy preservation will get defeated if this is done outside the database. And the way it is done, it has to be done inside the database is that you've got to kind of track the privacy budget associated with individuals. And so that as you modify the query, you also make sure that the uh, same user is not asking the question in 10 different ways. There's some great work done from Berkeley and then Uber, along with Uber, something called Chorus, which took that piece of work, that concept, and modified, didn't change the SQL on top, but internally the SQL gets rewritten in order to actually support this. So for them, the clear model really was that they actually preserved the, the SQL construct and, and you will see a lot more work being done around privacy. And as a community, 
as a community, you have got to understand whether you will lead the way for people to come to your software that we all love when privacy is central or whether you will follow. Okay, I'm going to skip on streaming. So in conclusion, you are truly great today. Yay, somebody said, absolutely. But you better, <laughs> better start running. Okay. The world continues to change. I don't know which of these things that I talked about are going to be hype or reality. I've tried to pick two or three that I believe have sustaining power. I've tried to say that, look, in that world, don't just run, don't just chase what might be the next thing. Run with purpose. You have always followed these North Stars. SQL, transactional consistency, and performance. Don't paper. Better than COBOL. Okay. <laughs> COBOL's heyday was, was uh, Y2K. Your product will still be central two decades from now. Okay. Follow these principles, and we'll all love what we create. Thank you. Thank you.